you need to spend money, you know, and I was literally spent my first £10. I was thinking, where's my first sale? You know, I've spent £10. <laughs> well, you know, I've just lost that. But don't see it as losing money. You know, what you need to see it as is buying data because that's essentially what you're doing. You're not, you're not losing money. We stand today. The Business Method with a shout The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, people of all ages, welcome to the Business Method Podcast, where we examine the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. Our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that had built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we are interviewing 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that generate a million dollars or more in annual revenue. There's a growing movement of people building these caliber of businesses and we wanted to get behind the minds the logic and the science of what it takes to build a business like this we've had some incredible guests like bobby edwards the founder of squatty potty who built a 35 million dollar per year company with just 17 employees and jp sears the youtube superstar whose videos are going viral all over the internet i'm your host chris reynolds and we hope you enjoy the show the business method Hey listeners, make sure you check out this episode today. Joining us is e-commerce millionaire Harry Coleman. Harry is a dropshipper who recently earned over a million dollars in two months on Shopify. He's an expert in the e-commerce space and he's recently launched a YouTube channel called Beast of Ecom where he teaches specific tactics for entrepreneurs to find success online. Harry and I get into a great conversation talking about how he created a million dollars in two months. He shares his tricks on picking niches, what niches are working on Shopify, some mistakes e-commerce entrepreneurs are making today and how to create a thousand dollars per day Facebook ad. Lastly, we talk about how Harry took his YouTube channel from zero to 2,300 subscribers in just three weeks. You guys, you want to listen to this episode. Without further ado, let's welcome Harry to the show. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Harry, welcome to the show, man. How are you? I'm very well, thank you very much, Chris. How are you doing today? Fantastic. And I hear you're calling in from the sunny UK, right? Well, you can say sunny again, but it's, uh, yeah, looking out my window, it's not exactly sunny. It's uh, pretty great today, <clears throat> but, um, you know, the UK weather is never fantastic. We get a blitz of, uh, you know, sun and then it's kind of gone and then it, we never see it for two or three months. But, yeah, uh, sunny when it wants to be. <clears throat> Which part of the UK are you in? I'm West Midlands based, so near Birmingham. And and why do you choose that location? Well, I'm born and bred. This was where family's kind of from. So uh, I've got a lot of family in London, <clears throat> and I do visit London quite a bit when I get a chance to actually pop down there. But um, but yeah, it's just London's just a little bit too too crazy for me to live there. Uh, so I try to stay out of it. Birmingham's, uh, you know. Big city, but um, you know, not as hectic as London. I'm curious. Um, you're kind of living. Are, are you in a countryside, or are you in a small town, or or what's your living yes. range? Yeah, so small sort of town. It's like solid hallway. So okay, by yeah, on the outskirts of Birmingham. So it's not exactly in the city wise. I've recently. Well, we're in Italy now, but I've recently spent some time in a you know in a countryside in a small town Mm -hmm. and I found like usually I'm in a big city uh Barcelona Mm -hmm. Rio de Janeiro you know uh, Thailand somewhere and and I found that there's so few distractions out here that that my productivity has really and my productivity has skyrocketed and my stress levels have decreased incredibly I'm curious if you find the same I do yeah I mean it's all well and good to kind of be around uh you know things running at 100 miles per hour uh but it comes down to the kind of person that you actually are and what you prefer I think um you know I'm all well and good for having the crazy sort of lifestyle and 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 all those sorts of things but when it's time to get things done uh you know there's a lot of distractions like you've mentioned in in being in a big city and, and all having a lot of options to go out and do things and stuff like that so kind of being in a place where those things are not as easily accessible uh yeah 100 percent agree that you know for me anyway uh you know it can help most definitely 
Yeah, I agree. Very cool, man. Well, welcome to the show, Harry. We're glad to have you. Um, you are a friend of Tim Caldwell, who introduced us and and who is also doing amazing things on with ecom. And uh, recently, you launched a pot, uh, YouTube uh, uh-huh. channel, which has done really well. And I was checking out your YouTube videos, and I was kind of uh-huh. impressed in some of the results that you've been getting. So uh-huh. we're going to dive into some of that. But first, I'd just like to ask you kind of a bit of your background so the listeners know who we're dealing with and, and where the beast of ecom came from. Yeah, so of uh, well, going back, it depends how far you actually want me to <laughs> go back with things. But uh, I mean, I'm not old by any sort of thing. I'm I'm only 27. But um, <clears throat> kind of my online journey, I've always wanted to live sort of this laptop lifestyle. You know, you kind of see it everywhere, and just kind of have the sort of time, location, independent, you know, freedom. Um, but with that being said, I've worked nine to fives before. Um, so going back, um, I used to sell bike parts. I used to collect bike parts. This is going back when I was kind of about 16 years old. <clears throat> I used to get bike parts, uh, create bikes, you know, spec out bikes and then sell them. That's kind of where my entrepreneurship kind of, you know, ways came around from an early age. Moving on from that and into the digital sort of space, um, my first kind of online sales came from eBay. Uh, selling on eBay. So what I done was, do you know snapback hats at all, Chris? No. What is that? So what they are is um, they're like fitted hats, you know, like, like like caps, but a lot of the wrappers and those sorts of ways. But they've got like a little strap at the back, so they yeah. snap, snap on. Yeah. Uh, and going back a few years ago, those were kind of um, popping off quite a bit in the states with like rappers like Chris Brown and, um, and and those sorts of guys used to wear them. So they kind of got really big in the states, but over here in the UK they weren't really easily accessible. So, uh, um, you know, we used to see all the rappers and stuff wearing them on TV, but everyone couldn't get them. You used to have to buy them from the States. So what I'd done was I used to import snapbacks from the States um, here in the UK and then sell them on eBay. And I was doing that. That's kind of where my first sort of online sales came. Um, Eventually, supply let me down. Um, I kind of gave up on on sort of the eBay side of things, uh, only because I didn't have time to find another supplier. Um, and then what I done was I moved on to, um, I created a gym brand, a uh, gym clothing brand, uh, again, sourcing from China. And that's where I kind of got my first uh, introduction into Shopify. So not Facebook adverts. I didn't know anything about Facebook adverts. I was only using Instagram for kind of, uh, you know, promotion and stuff like that. But I saw a supplier from Pakistan and China and used to import the clothes and, it was going sort of uh, great. I used to get great samples, but then when the final goods used to arrive, <laughs> I used to have stuff with misprints, mm-hmm. um, stuff, you know, quality that was absolutely completely different from the actual sample that I got. And in the end, you know, at the apparel side of things, you know, clothing, I just didn't really want to go into clothing at all. I kind of just left it at that because the suppliers were totally letting me down uh you know i'd lost money in terms of having a stock full of stuff that were just completely unsellable so i moved away from that um having the experience a little bit of experience on shopify um i came i was watching um black hat forum have you ever have you ever come across a forum called black hat forum at all i haven't i haven't no, um, well, basically, it's just a forum for internet marketers, um, and people are on there talking about all sorts of different ways to make money online and stuff like that, which I was always trying to do because, like I said previously, I wanted to live a sort of online laptop lifestyle. <clears throat> and uh, I read this, I came across this thread, and it was basically this guy had made five thousand dollars, <clears throat> five thousand or ten thousand dollars in a space of 30 days selling free products. Now, instantly, obviously, you think of that, you think, you know. What on earth is he doing? And back in the time, if, if you if you didn't think called um, free plus shipping at all, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah, free. But um, a lot of, if you know about drop shipping, then you probably know about free plus shipping. And basically, that's what he was doing. So he was using um, AliExpress, um, Shopify, and Facebook ads, and, and selling you know 
see products with a sort of high perceived value, such as like jewelry and stuff like that, selling them for free on Facebook, but then charging people shipping. Mm-hmm. Now, it kind of blew my mind when I saw it. <clears throat> I, you know, I thought this sounds too easy to be true. And um, anyway, I cut a long story short, I kind of went through everything, uh, read the thread top to bottom, got my store all up and running, got my business ad account all up and running and stuff like that. Uh, launched my first website, it was a niche website, and um, made no sales whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> no sales. Se- no sales whatsoever. I put my heart and soul into designing everything, uh, you know, and, you know, as you do, people seem to think that things is just, it sounded easy, you know, right. reading the concept, you get a product, you know, someone buys it, then you pay for it, you run a bad advert targeting, whatever it may be, and, you know, you bank. And unfortunately, you know, <laughs> I kind of done that and, yeah, I didn't make any money for about a week at all. So tested the first product. Um, again, didn't make any problem. Didn't make any sales whatsoever. Probably spent about eighty pounds, um, which is what probably about hundred dollars or something like that mm-hmm. on the first product. Tested another two. Again, no sales whatsoever. And you know, I thought, well, this doesn't work. But in the back of my head, I was thinking all I really need was just one sale because if you get one sale, then you know, everything else, you can make 10, you can make 100, and all the screenshots that you see in the Facebook groups and stuff like that then become valid. And, you know, the whole drop shipping model using Facebook and using AliExpress or wherever you may be getting your supplies from becomes real. Um, so I tested my third product, fourth product, and eventually I got one sale. And the feeling of getting your first sale I'm sure you're probably aware and, and anyone who's doing sort of in, you know, on e-commerce, the first sale is, it's a feeling like no other. Right. Um, you know, and no matter how much you do going on forward from that, you know, uh, even today, if I start up a new store, the first sale is always the best. Even mm-hmm. if you do a thousand per day, 10 K per day, whatever it may be, the first sale is always very special. Um, and, you know, the, the green notification popped up, um, Shopify and the PayPal notification popped up saying so-and-so has spent nineteen ninety nine on your uh, on your product. And from there, it was, uh, yeah, I've just been kind of rolling with the times, testing a lot of different things. And that's where I've kind of jumped into. So it's kind of a long story, but that's <laughs> where I'm at to the moment in, in time. Yeah, it's been scaling since. That's great, man. And now you're doing you're really well for yourself. I saw one YouTube video talking about making how uh, how you can make a million dollars in two months is that right yeah so that was uh that was from a willing product and uh, i kind of outlined it all in the the video itself so if anyone who hasn't really seen it i'm sure uh chris can link to it but um but yeah generally that was probably 70 percent of it came from 30 percent of a lot of that revenue came from um one single product um, and obviously, of course, a lot of what will generally happen is in, in you know, general stores and stuff like that. One product will make up the majority of the, it will bring in a lot of the sales. Um, and then the rest of the stuff will just be, you know, sort of added in or up sales and stuff like that. Now, uh, for the listeners, I know that um, a lot of e-com people don't like to share the products that they're selling because a bunch of people will jump in on that market, right? I'm, I'm guessing it's the same with you. <laughs> it is the same, but what I can share is what I've done uh, on the video is, of course, it was a it was a general product, so it had mass market appeal. Second of all, it solved a problem, um, and anyone who kind of listens to me as a uh, as a listener from anything that I put out on YouTube or in groups or anything like that is, I kind of you know the product two products that's you know that categories that fit with myself that I think uh you know people should be looking for when getting into the game is something that is unique has a unique uh sort of selling point quirky cool uh makes you know makes your viewers actually stop scrolling or it solves a problem it's a solution to a problem they're the two sort of best products to sell so when you're going out and you're looking for products um you know try and find those things but this product in question uh, had mass appeal, so it was easy to scale uh, in any sort of country, those sorts of things. And again, it was it was solving a problem. So uh, they kind of went hand in hand. Those are the three questions or three categories that you focus on when picking a niche. 
So yeah, I, I like well in terms of picking a niche, that's a bit of a different question. In terms of picking a niche, I kind of try to find something uh, a niche that's got uh, yeah mass appeal and loads of buyers. Okay, the size of the buyers uh, in there as well, and people who actually have money as well. So um, you know, there's loads of niches that are actually out there, but uh, you know, I try I, on on each store. I've got because I don't just run one store; I like to run multiple stores. Um, each store will focus on possibly two to three max different niches, instead of just having one store that focuses on say seven niches. I just find that a lot more easier and manageable. And and what are some of the ways that the listeners, if they're starting out, or even if they're you know experienced, what are some mm-hmm. of the ways that you focus? What are what what would you recommend to them uh, to work on to pick a good niche? So to pick a good niche, you want to make sure that there's first and foremost is the size. Like I mentioned, I like to. You can make money in any sort of niche, but if you want to make the money that is or find products that are going to kind of do these 50k per day 100k per day those sorts of ones it has to be large so say for example you take baby as a niche the baby keyword or baby interest on on um facebook is massive it's, it's in the millions mums are avid buyers and again not just the the niche baby you can break it down of course there's pregnancy which again is absolutely massive as well and again so on and so on there's loads of different interests to make sure that it's the actual a massive audience second of all is uh the competition now a lot of people kind of get scared of competition they seem to think okay if you know let's try and find a niche where no one's selling stuff I'm kind of in the opposite mode, okay? I want to find a niche where people are selling stuff because if people are selling stuff, then it means that there are buyers. If there are buyers, it means that there's money to be made. So, again, like I said, a lot of people seem to think, oh, competition, saturation, and all those sorts of things, and I'll try and stay away from it. I'm going to find a niche where no one's selling absolutely anything. You know, I'm going to go for uh, nurses who are also mums or something like that. Now, don't get me wrong, you can, you know, sell and make money in a niche where who for who are mums and who are nurses because it's highly niche um but i'd rather go on the opposite scale and try and fish in the lakes if that makes sense in the oceans should yeah. i say rather than rather than lakes what else what else on picking a niche would you focus on uh products as well so you want to make sure that there's a variety of products and not just you know any sort of you know there has to be a variety of products in a niche so um, again going back to baby there's not just clothes there's all sorts of different things there's um health different products there's uh you know safety different products there's all sorts of different products so the the range of products as well you want to make sure that there's a whole host of different ranges of products and not just one sort of single product within that niche and you mentioned a couple of niches, um, you know, babies and and mm-hmm. mothers. And w- what are some niches that are hot on Shopify now that are working really well? Um, well, I don't really want to give away my personal ones. Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> <'Cause but laughs> yeah, w- ones that you're not working on. Yeah. Um, well, techs and gadgets and uh, and beauty are ones that are doing really cool as well. Stuff that are quirky that people could, again stuff that solves. Probably, I've sold weird and wacky stuff before. Uh, again, I'm not going to mention what they sort of are. They're in a kind of a subcategory of beauty uh, and health. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I generally get targeted for stuff that I'm that for the for the stuff that I'm selling in essentially. So I'm I'm rarely looking outside of my niche if that makes sense. And again, the products that I'm getting showed through my Facebook feed and stuff like that are generally in my niche. So um, in terms of stuff that is hot right this moment in time, apart from it, without deviating and, and mentioning my sort of niche, because <laughs> uh, my niche is, is kind of hot. Uh, but a lot of things, what you can do is obviously to find out those things, again, in terms of the the what's popping right now is Google Trends. And I use Google Trends quite a bit if I want to look into a new niche as well. Uh, just to see, you know, if there are things that are popping up that you can try and get into while riding the trend. Because someone made a lot of money out of fidget spinners. You've got to remember that. A uh, hell of a lot of money out of fidget spinners. Uh, and if you can catch a trend or a niche when it's just taking off, uh, again, you can make a lot of money in a short period of time. 
What do you think are some unfulfilled niches out there, Harry? Unfulfilled niches in, in what sort of time, in what sort of way? Niches that you think might work without, you know, giving away anything that you plan to work on. Niches that you think that, you know, make some really make a good business out of. You know, every you know, as we as we see business, I know like I see either stores or niches or things that are happening online that I'm like, how come somebody doesn't create a business in that area? Because that seems like a gold mine, you know? So just, just curious if you've noticed any niches on e that, that you think somebody should really go after. I think customizable stuff for, um, for people is, 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 is stuff in terms of like customizable, jewelry i know a lot of people um there's some businesses that i've seen one or two that are trying to get into it but really highly customizable jewelry uh for people um is something that i did look into <clears throat> at some point as well i didn't progress with it mainly due down to time but uh customizable jewelry again with that sort of side of things you can very much with it being so general, you can go into so much things, you know, mm-hmm. again, you can customize jewelry for mothers, for babies, and then you can go on to, to, to pets where I think it's just finding the right supplier, uh, you know, to work with. But if you can get a high quality supplier and customize jewelry, because I think that's what sets you aside from, you know, any sort of general dropship or general store, you know, stuff like that, being highly customizable. Um, you know, and giving people the option to put their own stamp on things is, uh, is yeah, you, you can, and again, at that time as well, you can charge a very much a premium price for that service. So some, you know, a normal, uh, you know, necklace that you charge, say, $50 for, you can easily whack an extra $50 on it if a person can, you know, put their own face on it and customise engrave the background. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of something that, again, I did sort of look at, but... Uh, you know, I didn't go into, but best of luck if someone, any of the listeners do go ahead and make a ton of money for it. Um, <laughs> I'll send you an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, what do you think are some of the biggest mistakes people are making on Shopify these days? I think one of the, I think the biggest mixtape is, biggest mistake, sorry, is first of all, for people who come into the game, it's just thinking that it's, you know oversimplifying things and making things seem this is generally down to the people who some people who put out content is making it seem you know as easy as it is you know doing xyz and making a ton of money when in reality it's not that easy and there's a ton of different factors that come into play and you know you've got to set your expectations which what a lot of people don't kind of do and again i kind of did it when i first got into it you know and we're all kind of responsible of doing it of thinking you know if i get this product and i target xyz you know it's going to make me money when in reality it doesn't actually work like that so that's one thing that people shouldn't do okay is when coming into shopify is um or e-commerce or drop shipping or whatever it may be is not assuming that obviously the first product is going to make you money okay now you can strike lucky okay if you, if you get everything right you know from your audience the product and the offer which are the three main things that need to be aligned for something to take off um but you know that's one thing that people need to stop doing is, is really manage your expectations Second of all is that, of course, you need to spend money, okay? Now, again, I didn't, I, I was spending money, you know, and I was literally spent my first £10. I was thinking, where's my first sale? And mm-hmm. I spent £10. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I've just lost that. Um, but don't see it as losing money. You know, what you need to see it as is buying data because that's essentially what you're doing. You're not, you're not losing money. A lot of people think, oh, I've spent, you know, £50 or $50 on this product. It's not making me any sales. Uh, you know, I've just lost this money or I've lost all this money in, you know, testing these products. But you've not lost the money because essentially you're just buying data. That's all it is. You've brought data that doesn't work. So you know that, you know, X, Y, that product don't work or your audience doesn't work or the offer is just not aligning with that audience. That's all it is. And they're the variables that you need to change. Um 
but people coming into this game don't see it at that level. They just see, um, you know, very much, you know, uh, if I do this, I'll do that equals that, which, you know, doesn't really work. Um, but there's some of the things, the, the main things that are, that mistakes that people make um, and choosing products as well. I'll, I'll add another one onto there as well is, is choosing products that, you know, can just be found they don't fall into my categories you know there there'll be something like a phone case but they won't just be a cool quirky phone case or a phone case that sort of uh you know solves a, a major problem or something like that it'll just be a normal phone case or a pair of socks or something like that and it's a real big mistake as well product choice is everything because if you have you know you can have the the best ads in the world or something like that but if your product sucks and people don't like the product it will not make sales at all so um you know product uh, product is is again another thing that people do get wrong Harry how long did it take you from when you started in income until you say say your first ten thousand dollars in sales <sighs> So yeah, so as I mentioned, when I first got up and running, um, made no sales whatsoever. Um, generally, that was back uh, going back two years ago. Um, CPMs were a lot lower uh, back then. Uh, if you you know if, if any of the listeners and stuff who are kind of um, been on Facebook and been advertising on Facebook for a number of years, they will know that things with Facebook themselves have changed. Um, <clears throat> but so to get my first sale, it wasn't. It didn't take extremely long. It took probably, I think I got my sale in the second or third week of actually testing products. Um, but from there, from the first sale to my first 10,000 was probably about one to two months because what I did was my first website was a niche store. Mm-hmm. Um, I was finding products that didn't fit the niche whatsoever. So I couldn't advertise them. And I was thinking these products, I was thinking in the back of my head, these products will sell, okay? These products are cool, you know, these products solve problems, these products look quirky, you know, but they, they don't fit the niche. So I couldn't sell them. What I wanted to do is I shut down the first side that I ever made. I think it probably broke even in the end, probably at a loss, a uh, break even or a loss. Uh, but I started a, then a general store. So a store where I could test a load of products. Um, and that's kind of where I started to get my success. So I was starting to be able to sell a load of products that are, you know, that were outside the niche, you know, more cool, more more better than what I was in previously. Um, but yeah, around about one to two months from opening up the general store is where I started getting, you know, the real success and finding my first initial winners that I could scale up. That's pretty good, man. And and then how long from that point until you hit seven figures? Well, the first year I had a goal of just hitting um, 100k. That right. was it. And in the summer, uh, the summer I came across a product and a, a different targeting technique, which I saw on a webinar. Because me myself, I'm always learning. You know, I, I always like to learn. So even if there's a webinar that I know 80% of it, I might know. Okay, they might be rehashing the same old things, but there might just be something in that webinar that I was not doing, or there may not be, or there may be something on a a blog post or a YouTube video that I may not know or I may not be trying. That's why it's always important to be in as many groups as possible. So um, I tried out this one technique. I found this product. Okay, this product was uh, this product. This campaign was actually bigger than the campaign that was done this year it resulted in 900k in one month that's the highest month i've ever done before so Mm -hmm. i didn't i've not hit a million just yet but um hopefully we (laughs) we can soon but again this one product it solved a problem okay it was cool quirky and the audience for it was massive so that came probably three to four months after um this campaign i'd I'd learned this thing that in this webinar of uh it was basically flex targeting no one was really doing flex targeting at that time you know when when facebook allowed the 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 way to be able to narrow Mm -hmm. stuff um and i was i was never kind of doing flex targeting at all um i tried out this technique of flex targeting so what i had was a massive niche a massive interest at the top and then i'd flex it down with loads of different um loads of different interests all stacked together and then I flex it a third time 
with a uh, another big massive broad uh, interest and i'll dupli- uh, not duplicate it, but i'll ju- yeah i'll duplicate the ad sets but then change the last um change the last interest so the last main massive interest if that makes sense can can you define a little bit more about flex targeting for the listeners yeah of course so flex targeting how flex targeting works let's say for example you are targeting let's go back to babies um if you're targeting babies and then wanted to target let's say for example nurses this is just going back from what i just said what you can do is you can put in the interest baby at the top which may be something absolutely massive like 50 million people and then there's an option to say narrow audience just beneath the interest box now if you click that that says narrow interest you can then put in another interest and what when you put in that other interest facebook will then go and find people who like the first interest but they also have to like that second interest as well so going back to babies and nurses if you put babies in the first one and then nurses in the second one facebook will then define you an audience which is full of people who like the interest babies, but also like stuff in nurses. So uh, that's how flex targeting works in short. Gotcha. Thank you. So um, you mentioned like cool, quirky, quirky products that um, could be sold to the masses. And I just want to give an example to the listeners so they can uh, get a picture in their minds. We had the founder of Squatty Potty on the show about a year mm-hmm. ago, and that's a perfect, um, perfect product. So they could understand it's it's well. It, it's not a cool product, but they made it cool with their videos, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yeah. It's quirky, you know, and, and with their branding and marketing, they definitely made it quirky, the, the Squatty Potty. And it can mm-hmm. be sold to the masses because everybody, you know, needs to go number two. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and it's, it's healthy, you know. It's a, it's, there's a health craze. It's, it's a part of health. And so people bought into it. So it's products like that that can really – that I think Harry's talking about that can really take off. Um you you also something I wanted to chat about a little bit more about Facebook ads. You had a video where you um, were talking about creating a thousand dollar a day Facebook ad, meaning a Facebook ad that that produces a thousand dollars a day. Uh, I'm curious, like if you can just share some of the suggestions of what's working for you on Facebook ads now. Yeah, so right about now, again, Facebook's always changing and last year i was heavily on uh, manual bidding i was i was heavily on manual bidding um i've kind of, right about in the last sort of two to three months uh i've kind of laid off manual bidding and kind of the more high bid auto uh set or auto bid sets <clears throat> um again you know in the period when i was uh doing that that campaign cpm sort of kind of absolutely rocketed and um cambridge cambridge analytica stuff was all out and uh, also the what we like to call the, the the third quarter dump was happening as well so in media buyers and stuff it gets up to january february march end of march month of march and the remaining budget that they have they like to absolutely spend it and outbid everyone so cpms go up and stuff like that but um right about now I'm sticking to sort of more auto bid and letting Facebook uh, auto optimize on my auto bids rather than going out and doing manual bidding, which was working highly effective with me uh, with with sort of last year. But I kind of laid off it a little bit more this year. Also, I really stopped doing duplication as well. Uh, Last year, I was completely against it. I used to think, you know, uh, it's competing with with ad sets and and all those sorts of things. And recently now I went back to duplication. Again, I'm always in the Facebook groups and seeing what's kind of working for other people. Uh, And duplication was something that kind of came up. Um, But not just duplicating it to a higher budget, but sometimes just literally just duplicating it as an exact. So if you've got something at $10 or $50 and you want to simply just double spending without increasing budgets and, and screwing up optimization and stuff like that, just literally duplicating it, uh, you know, maybe two or three times and seeing which one is doing the best, uh, cutting off your losers, keeping your winners. So duplication is something that I've heavily been doing on winning ad sets and stuff like that now as well. So uh, higher auto bids and duplication is something that's uh, that's working for me right now. Right on. 
Now, you recently uh, released a YouTube channel, what, just mm-hmm. four or five weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's correct, yep. So uh, three, three and a half weeks ago. Nice. It's called The Beasts of Ecom, and you already have 2,000... 2.3 thousand subscribers, 2,300. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there that struggle with YouTube and, and really would love to uh, get their subscribers up. What, what's working for you, Harry? What, how'd you have such, how are you having such rapid success? Well, it's, uh, it's kind of blowing my mind as well, but uh, <laughs> I am quite calculated with, with what I kind of do. Um, of course, the case study and the numbers that I've been able to generate and stuff like that helps because, of course, naturally, you know, with that sort of uh, level of, of so-called quoted success, uh, people like to learn from people who are doing, you know, the numbers that they want to achieve to, to get. So that has played a little bit of a, a factor. Another factor that has helped me is really doing my research into uh, that YouTube SEO and how YouTube SEO works. <clears throat> um, so I spent some time previously to actually setting up the channel is how, you know, how it all works, how YouTube SEO, how they rank videos, you know, what to go for and all those sorts of things. And that's what I kind of been implementing. And I'm still learning because, of course, I'm by no means have no experience with YouTube whatsoever so this is something that's completely new to myself as well so uh that is one thing that of course has played a bit of a uh, uh, a part in things and as well as just being active when i say active i mean putting out content okay putting out quality content so the videos i made sure that of course you know the youtube channel looked professional the logo was designed the brand itself was all designed by myself uh, the video production and stuff is uh, again you know i had to purchase all the equipment i had no idea of which camera to buy you know which lighting to buy which mic to buy those sorts of things were stuff that i had to research into you know but i wanted to make sure because i'm a bit of a perfectionist you see i wanted to make sure that sound quality and audio quality and the the content that i produced was at a high level so i think that again plays a little bit of a part in um in in the growth as well as just putting out fantastic content and being active with people as well so uh you know responding to questions responding to comments on the youtube putting out stuff on your instagram putting out stuff on your instagram stories and just being seen to be active as possible and uh, you know documenting what you're doing and inspiring people and of course ultimately helping people because uh you know that's really what matters the information if the information that you put out doesn't help people then you're not really going to attract any sort of following so i think they're the sort of basis is that have uh that have helped it grow into kind of a such a level to what it is at the moment in time which i hope continues um in the next few months as well I'd love to know uh, what your objective is with YouTube because, you know, there's a lot of people that could say, hey, Harry, you know, you're doing really great on Shopify. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're, you're crushing it. You know, why are you going out into the YouTube world and creating another, you know, another channel or, or much more work for yourself? Like, so so just kind of curious, what's your, your purpose for creating the channel? Well, it's the same as uh, as anything, you know, uh, the way I see it is, if you've got information, then why keep it to yourself? At the end of the day, I didn't really have... When I first got started with things, there weren't that much information actually out there. So YouTube back then, two years ago, there weren't many videos on on doing this sort of thing. And with the experience that I've got, um, you know, why be so selfish, essentially? And, you know, like I say, there's very few people, again, like you say, there's people. there's two sorts of coins. There'll be people saying... Oh, you know, um, if you do so well at Shopify, why are you starting YouTube? You know, what's the point in in, in doing that and stuff like that? Mm-hmm. But then it's like, okay, why not? You know, at the end of the day, if you build it up to a point where it's 30K subscribers, you know, there's information there and it brings in another additional revenue stream, great. Gary uh, Gary V's got a, a YouTube channel. He's got an Instagram channel. He runs a multi-million pound company. You know, there's no harm or, or disrespect in having multiple, you know, revenue channels as well as giving away information that helps people. So, you know, like I say, that there are people on two sides of coins, some people who will be completely against it and, and be like, oh, you, you know, there's always <laughs> going to be that. And, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're always going to be there. You can't get away from it, you know, and I understand it. But it's a question, it's more of a question of, uh, of why not rather than why. 
Yeah, it makes sense. And it, and I think it's something that's great for just connecting with people. You know, yeah, of course. There's other. I'm sure there's other Shopify uh, people doing great in Shopify that would love to connect with you, and you guys can exchange ideas and learn how to do it better just because they saw you on YouTube and that sort of thing. Harry, I think uh, we're going to wrap it up soon, but I've just got a couple more questions for the for the hustlers out there, those entrepreneurs mm-hmm. that are to six figures, trying to hit the seven figures, five figures, trying to hit the, the six figures, seven figures, trying to hit the eight figures. What do you say to them? What's your your biggest tools of or your recommendations for people that are hustling and just trying to get to the next level? If you're trying to get to the next level, um, I've, I've got this in, in, in a video and. What it is, is three sort of things. Now, the first, well, two sort of things, because, of course, if you're already out there and you're hustling stuff, you're, you're, you're doing it anyway. But um, the most importantly is is setting goals, okay, tangible goals, which are, uh, like I said, tangible and quantifiable. So, like, my goal for the end of this year is to hit 10K subscribers on YouTube. That is That is what I want to do. Okay, I've got no experience in YouTube at all prior to starting it, but that is the goal. So if you've got a goal, when I, and again, when I first started out, my goal was to hit, um, you know, 100k in a year. That's what I wanted to do. Completely surpassed it, but that was what the goal was. So make sure you've got a goal in mind uh, and that it's tangible and it's set in a certain time period because that way you work a lot better. Not just I want to hit seven figures, you know, because you can just hit seven figures in in ten years you know, accumulation, put a time constraint on it and work towards it. And, you know, make sure you're setting the goals, smaller goals to achieve those bigger goals that you want to actually get to. Second of all is, of course, staying in your lane, which I mentioned before. Um, Now, you know, it's highly easy out there to get distracted. Um, You know, everyone gets distracted. I even get distracted. But it's important that you just focus on yourself and again, realizing that you are your only competitor, you know, it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing, um, you know, whatever else other people, if I'm doing seven figures and someone else is only doing six figures, it doesn't matter. Because there was that one point where I could not break 10K per day. I, I just couldn't do it. You know, mm-hmm. I just could not do it at all. Uh, you know, I hit five, I hit like thousand. Cool. I hit five, five thousand to 10,000, um, you know. Some for some time it feels impossible, and you're looking at people making ten thousand, and you just think, what on earth are they doing, you know? But have the goal, stay in your lane, don't get too caught up in what other people are doing. As long as you are better than you was, um, you know, the day before, week before, months before, and you're moving towards that goal that you set, uh, you will get there in the end. Just stay as focused as possible on the goal in hand. So you mentioned hitting 10K on YouTube. What are some of your other goals, your big goals? So the big goals, I'll still want to hit uh, a million in one year, which I'm not in one year, in in one month, which I haven't done. I came close last year. Um, uh, I've got another, I've got investment goals as well, which are due in property. So I want to, um, I'm looking to accumulate at least another two properties this year. Uh, as well so they're they're sort of another they're they're outside of a v-com but they are very much close to my heart in terms of long-term wealth as well so uh they're things i don't want to do as well um and i've got another one which i can't really share but uh but yeah it's uh it's quite a personal one but uh but but yeah I've got, those those are some of the main e-com sort of number goals that I, that, that I want to hit so you know million in a month uh and um yeah the property ones are, are ones that i want to do as well well when you hit that that million in a month let us know we'll have you back on the show for a follow-up no problem at all when i uh, when i do hit that one it will be champagne all around <laughs> harry thanks for coming on the show man we really enjoyed all the tools and tips and tricks and tactics that you shared with us if the listeners mm-hmm. wanted to reach out and we'll put all the links in the show notes you know um but if the listeners want to reach out and learn more about you i'm guessing youtube's the best place any any anywhere else yeah yeah youtube uh my youtube channel rubber now if you again if you got any sort of value from this or want to learn more about e-commerce and stuff like that again my youtube is the best place to hit me up and check out the content i do upload on a weekly basis 
um, putting out anything but uh, you know as much value as I possibly can for the viewers. So YouTube is one place. Again, if you do enjoy the content, please do subscribe. That I would fully appreciate that. Alternatively, uh, Instagram again is probably uh, the next best place to hit out to me as well. Um, it's just at Beast of Ecom. And, uh, and yeah, they're probably the two main places. I can be found on Facebook. I do have a Facebook group, but I won't kind of uh, uh, preach any of those uh, right about now. But you can find them. But YouTube and, uh, and Instagram are probably the best places to, to catch me at. Right on. And that's Beast of Ecom, E-C-O-M with a one yep, M, so, correct? Yep so, yep. so at Beast of E-C-O-M, yeah, Beast of Ecom. Um, right. That's my, uh, my Instagram handle. Right on. Harry, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing everything with us. We really appreciate it. We love hearing from uh, brilliant business minds, and uh, we definitely had that today. So thank you so much. No problem, Chris. I appreciate the opportunity, mate. Really do. And listeners, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you guys for tuning in once again, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners, thanks again for joining the show. We wanted to remind you about our Get Shit Done one-on-one productivity coaching that we recently just launched. What we do is work with you to create big business goals that are absolutely game changers. We make a plan together and put you in our productivity hacking system that helps you stay on target. Each week, you get a call with yours truly about what steps to take for the following week. Some say it's like a year of productivity in just three months. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching. Thebusinessmethod.com forward slash coaching.